Thank you. Thank you and welcome to Norwich University and the Todd Lecture sponsored by the College of Graduate and Continuing Studies as part of our keynote for the 2017 Residency Conference. For those that don't know me, I'm Bill Clements, Dean of the College of Graduate and Continuing Studies. The Todd Lecture Series is named in honor of retired U.S. Army Major General and President Emeritus W. Russell Todd, Class of 1950 and his late wife, Carol, in gratitude for their service and dedication to Norwich University and the larger Northfield community. I'd also like to recognize Todd's daughter and son-in-law, John and Ellen Drew, and the Drew Foundation, who have generously donated resources to Norwich University for the specific purpose of funding this lecture series. We are pleased to host Mrs. Sarah Gallagher at this evening's lecture, General and Mrs. Todd's daughter. Mrs. Gallagher, would you please stand so we can welcome you? The Todd Lecture Series program will always be free and open to the greater Vermont community as well as the Norwich student body and is streamed live to students and alumni across the globe. So welcome to all of those who are watching on the um, internet tonight. This evening's lecture is Peter Warren Singer. Dr. Singer is a strategist at New America and an editor at Popular Science Magazine. He was named by the Smithsonian as one of the nation's 100 leading innovators by Defense News as one of the 100 most influential people on defense issues, by Foreign Policy as their top 100 global thinkers list, and by Analytica Social Media Data Analysis, one of the 10 most influential voices in the world on cybersecurity and the 25th most influential in the field of robotics. His award-winning books include Corporate Warriors, The Rise of Privatized Military Industry, Children at War, Wired for War, the Robotics Revolution and Conflict in the 21st Century, and Cybersecurity and Cyber War, What Everyone Needs to Know. His latest book is Ghost Fleet, a novel of the next world war, which many of our graduate students read before their arrival to campus in a coordinated last read initiative. Ghost Fleet is a techno thriller crossed with nonfiction research and co-authored with August Cole, whom we have also welcomed to campus this week. They will both be participating in a book signing following tonight's lecture. Dr. Singer has an extensive CV that you see in the program. I'd suggest that you take a look. He has served as coordinator of President Obama's 2008 campaign's Defense Policy Task Force in the office of the Secretary of Defense and as the founding director of the Center for the 21st Century Security and Intelligence at the Brookings Institution. Brookings Institution where Singer was the youngest person named a senior fellow in its 100-year history. So without further ado, please welcome Peter Singer. So thank you for the very kind introduction and also to the lecture series for making all of this possible. And I also just wanted to add my congratulations to all the students and their families gathered here. Uh, this is a very special week, I know, for the organization, but also for you personally. So a little bit of background uh, more about myself and where I'm coming from on this uh, work. So I uh, work at what's known as a think tank. Uh, it's a place called New America. If you're not familiar with us, we are a non-governmental, non-partisan organization that wrestles with where research technology and policy all come crashing together. So we work on topics that range from the future of the internet to the future of early childhood education. And relevant to your work, we've got two projects. They're different, but they're related. One is on cybersecurity and the other is on the future of war. And each one of them reflects the networked uh, nature of these spaces. And they involve bringing together a diverse group of experts. So for example, the future of war team has everything from uh, historians to former uh, general counsel at the Pentagon to technologists to uh, recently retired military officers with backgrounds that range from Air Force acquisition officers to former members of Navy SEAL Team 6. And what we're all trying to do is wrestle with the future. Now, the challenge, and this applies both to our work, but um, more broadly to those of us who look at the issues of security writ large, is that we're not very good at it. 
we have a terrible track record at trying to predict the future. And my favorite example of this, it, it, it's very politic right now to beat up on the New York Times, so I'll do that. Um, but I'm gonna use an older example of it. Uh, it came on October 9th, 1903. And on that date, the New York Times tried to predict the future. And it said, quote, the flying machine, which might really fly, might be evolved by the combined and continuous efforts of mathematicians and mechanicians, that's what they used to call engineers, in from one to 10 million years from now, end quote. The exact date that the New York Times published that, those two brothers there, the Wright brothers, began to assemble the first working flying machine in that bicycle shop there in Dayton, Ohio. Now, we could throw our hands up in the air and say, gosh, the future is unpredictable. We shouldn't even try. It's like driving in the dark with your headlights off. The reality, though, is that first, um, you don't have a choice, whether you're working in education and training to budgeting to doctrine to strategy, operational planning. You are a futurist. You have to wrestle with the future. The second thing is that I would argue we don't have a great track record at trying to predict specific events with any kind of great confidence, but we can identify the forces that are out there that might shape the potential future worlds that lie ahead of us. Now, the way I like to illustrate this is imagine a tea kettle on top of a stove. Now, with all of our advanced science today, we can send a, you know, a robot to Mars that can Twitter back at us, but if we're asked to predict the behavior of that water in that tea kettle at the molecular level, we can't do it. We just don't know what each water molecule is gonna do next. But if we're looking at that system, we wouldn't say, gosh, it's inherently unpredictable. We would ask ourselves very basic questions like, for example, is the heat on? Knowing that if enough heat is applied to that tea kettle, we don't know exactly when or where, but that water molecule will turn to steam. Now that doesn't mean that is the inevitable future. All sorts of other things can happen. Your little son can come along and knock the tea kettle over. The point though is if you were looking at that system, trying to predict the future, you would identify heat, whether the stove is on or off, as a key trend, a key force to pay attention to. As John Naismith once said, trends, like horses, are easier to ride in the direction that they're headed. So if we're trying to you know, wrestle with the trends that are out there, um, in particular, the ones that are gonna shape your careers as you move into these various leadership roles as you leave here in the future, I think there's in particular three related to my work that um, will be important, and important in terms of not just what's gonna happen tomorrow or in the next year, but over that generational long issue. And they break into technology itself, but also a new kind of place and a new kind of race. And what's important and different is that in each one of these areas, the United States has been in the leadership role, but maybe won't be moving forward. Now, the first one of these is technology, but it's a very special kind of technology, and it goes by lots of different buzzwords. So uh, it used to be in the Rumsfeld era Pentagon, revolutionary technology. Now it's known as disruptive technology. If you're outside the military, weirdly enough, you call it a killer app. What are we talking about here? We're talking about technology that is not a evolutionary improvement, you know, the difference between iPhone 6 and iPhone 7, but a leap ahead, the difference between a regular phone and a smartphone. And what defines this is not just the idea that it gives you something that was a capability, that was science fiction a generation earlier, but how it provokes a whole new set of questions that were science fiction a generation earlier. That is, it doesn't solve all your problems. And they're questions about what's possible that you didn't imagine was possible before, but maybe more important, there are questions about what is proper that you weren't wrestling with a generation earlier. And that what is proper might be anything from what is the proper way to organize my business or my military unit, or who's the proper person to recruit or train, to maybe it's a question of what is proper when it comes to new legal or ethical questions that we weren't wrestling with a generation earlier. So what are some of these kind of technologies that we're seeing out there? Uh, a couple years back, I was part of a project that was sponsored by the Pentagon known as Nextech. 
And essentially uh, what we did is that, uh, much like the research that you've been doing, is that to answer this, we went around and we conducted a study. And what we did is we interviewed about 60 subject matter experts with very diverse backgrounds. So everything from uh, people working at military organizations like DARPA, the entity that invented the internet itself, or the Office of Naval Research was another, another place, to people outside of the military, uh, working in university labs and academia, to people working in business at leading technology companies like Google and Facebook, to people on the investment side, venture capitalists, those that are putting their money and making the future come true. And we asked all of these very different people the same basic question. What do you think today is equivalent to the computer in 1980. So it's not science fiction, it exists, but it's poised to change the world the way the computer did. And their answer is, this is a word cloud, but don't focus on the word cloud, is they basically broke down into five what you might imagine as technology bucket areas, categories of technology. And as I'm going through them, go back and think about that parallel of the computer both in terms of how it jumped back and forth and changing everything from war to your family life to business, but also think about all the decisions you either made or wish we had made relative to computers that we wish we could kind of go back on. And imagine those applied to these technology areas moving forward. Now, the first one of these technology areas is hardware, specifically robotics. We've gone through an amazing change. Uh, so we're a little bit past the 15 year anniversary of our forces going into Afghanistan. And the force that went in had a handful of unmanned aerial systems. If you're like our Air Force people here, we call them remotely piloted aircraft. If you're like the rest of them, we would call it drones. We had a handful, none of them armed. The ground force had zero unmanned ground systems, ground robotics, equally none of them armed. Today in the US military, we have over 10,000 drones, and many of them are, of course, armed, to another 12,000 on the ground. We're not the only players. Uh, New America, we've identified 86 different countries' militaries that have robotics in them today. It's not just militaries. It's also uh, non-state actors that range from uh, the Dallas Police Department this last summer used a jury-rigged armed ground robot to kill a sniper to uh, right now in the Battle of Mosul, ISIS has conducted over 200 drone missions, a third of them armed. Now, sometimes people go, oh, well, the ISIS ones, you know, they're not all that great. You know, they're, they're, they're ones they made themselves. They're kind of junky. They're science fiction compared to a generation earlier. We dreamed of having that kind of capability. But of course, the shift is not just in terms of the numbers, it's how we think about and experience maybe the most important thing that goes on, war itself. You just watched an act of war and you just experienced the same way that the person who pulled the trigger did, sitting thousands of miles away, remote from danger in a seat. There's something going on here when we think about the overall history, the story of war and how we experience it. But that's the history, what's moving forward. With robotics, we're seeing all sorts of different changes and everything from their uh, designs, particularly as we move away from thinking about them as pure replacements for manned machines, and even the way we talk about them. So unmanned systems, driverless cars, a lot like how we used to call them horseless carriages, defining something by what it's not rather than what it is, automobile, robot. As we move away from being locked in that kind of mindset, it shifts everything from the design. So we stop thinking about drones as being, you know, planes with the cockpit painted over. It allows us to think about fundamentally different um, sizes to we can draw inspiration from vastly different uh, designers, maybe the best designer of all, nature. Um, now, this little system here, uh, you can see it, it's flying in San Francisco. Recently, someone lost one of these in Somalia. I can't imagine why someone would want to fly a drone that looks like a little bird in Somalia. Maybe some of the security studies people can help us figure out the why on that. It's not just, though, the design. Maybe more important is the shift in their intelligence and their autonomy. 
you're about to watch a historic moment where a robotic system is about to take on the role that a Navy pilot will happily tell you is the toughest pilot task of all. In fact, they can't stop talking about how it's such a tough task to take off and land from an aircraft carrier. As you can see, it does it perfectly, and it can do it perfectly again and again and again. And it's not just the idea that it can do it perfectly, it's also the fact that it can then transfer that knowledge on how to do it perfectly instantaneously to another like system. Compare that to how not everyone can be a pilot, not everyone can be a Top Gun pilot, not every Top Gun pilot can be perfect, and they can't then train someone else to be perfect like them. They can pass on their knowledge, but it takes literally months. Now, this shift when it comes to robotics and their intelligence is moving in two fundamentally different um, directions. Uh, and one is in terms of kind of large scale systems uh, that are very clear replacements. So for example, in the um, Ghost Fleet project that August and I worked on, we identified 21 different examples of um, autonomous robotics projects that the Pentagon is working on right now. This right here is a, uh, it's the first fully robotic ship. Um, it's not science fiction. We have, may have written a novel, but uh, I recently was on board this ship. It's in San Diego. It's testing there uh, right now. The idea of a robotic ship has introduced very interesting issues. Um, so relevant to its summertime, it doesn't have air conditioning on it, because why would you have air conditioning on a ship? But then that's made life really tough for the humans that have to repair the ship inside it in uh, the heat of summer, or when it was previously uh, it was based in the Gulf of Mexico. But the direction of these is so one is large scale physical systems. And this a little bit parallels nature, where if you think about um, in nature, for some species, intelligence is in a single system, and that system, that person, for example, that animal, can do the task on their own. So a good commercial illustration of this was in this, um, uh, ooh, we've got something, going, there we go. All right, uh, it was, this was a commercial that showed during the NFL playoffs where Budweiser was excited to show this 18-wheeler leaving a Budweiser bottling plant carrying thousands of cans of beer, and hold it, gosh, the truck driver just got up. So a very clear, direct, obvious replacement, large-scale physical system. Now, um, one note on, it's sort of odd that Budweiser was excited about this, because when you pull back and think about the potential disruptive effects of this on the American economy, you see this layout of uh, the most popular job by state, and how Budweiser just said, isn't it cool that a lot of these jobs are about to be automated? Um, not what you want to think about when you're watching the NFL playoffs uh, if you're a truck driver. But the point is, that's one direction of robotics and autonomy. The other is just like in nature, we have other species like insects or ants where each little individual is not all that smart, but together they can do incredibly complex tasks. They disaggregate it, they network it. So we see the same version going on with robotics. So take that simple example of delivering a drink. We had an 18-wheeler delivering tens of th thousands of cans of beer to 7-Eleven has already used a small drone to deliver a single Slurpee drink to someone's house. First, that represents an entire new kind of business model that you, know, you wouldn't have done before. Second, it shows how science fiction is coming true again, in this case, Wally, -E, how uh, lazy we are. Um, the point, though, is that's not just a story of hardware. It leads to the second technology bucket, software, where we see advancement, but also how they're linked together. And maybe one of the bigger shifts here to be aware of is the emergence of the Internet of Things. So right now, there are approximately 7 billion of these devices in the world that we use to communicate back and forth. Now, these devices um, you know, mostly computers. Moving forward, though, we are going to see, as you note from this chart, about 50 billion uh, things linked up. But they're going to be different. They're going to be everything from smart cars, robotics, thermostats, refrigerators, you name it. Now, it's not just the raw number, but it's also a shift in terms of what they carry. So each of these things packs multiple sensors. 
that is a part of the system that's collecting information about the world around it. So some of them are pretty you know, obvious sensors, like your cell phone's camera. But your cell phone, uh, you know, my phone has about 25 sensors on it. Obvious ones like the camera, but it also has things operating in the background, like for example, geolocation. Um, and the point is that when you crunch the numbers, those 50 billion things actually yield about a trillion sensors gathering data about the world around us. What does that yield? Big data. More data than we've ever had before in human history, but importantly, different forms of data being brought together that allow us to draw entire new insights about the world around us, surprising insights. My favorite illustration of this is they did a study of, this is for the criminal justice people in the room, they found that judges sentenced people to jail for about 2% longer if the sports team in their hometown lost the night before. Now, you know, that seems very marginal, 2%. That's, you know, statistically insignificant. But if that's, if you're going to jail for 2% longer because, you know, the Cleveland Cavs lost the night before, that doesn't seem fair. But the point is, is that human researchers, if they're looking at judges sentencing, that's not where they would automatically look. But machines, algorithms, were able to bring these insights together in new different ways. The point is, is that what we see here is also a story of artificial intelligence. We've grown numb to the spread of AI around us. AI is why, for example, your kids can't spell. Autocomplete, right? But more important, AI is becoming strong and taking on top human tasks, um, not just winning at Jeopardy, but in fields like medicine. For example, they perform better at um, uh, identifying cancer than top human oncologists to um, a lot of people in here working in cybersecurity. At the uh, DEF CON convention recently, um, Mayhem, an AI, uh, won at a bug hunting task that takes humans weeks. It did it in a matter of minutes, which then raises the interesting question, will we see parts of the cybersecurity field go through what factory workers and those truck drivers are going through? Another bucket area. Waveware, energy, new forms of energy coming onto line, old forms being distributed in new ways, but it also redefines technology itself. So a good illustration of this would be that drone there at the bottom. That one is powered uh, not by regular aviation gas, but by um, a hydrogen. And then there's another one that uses solar. And the point is that these systems, and they're being worked on both by DARPA, but by Facebook. Facebook system, uh, they didn't even bother to design landing gear for it because it's going to stay up in the air, not for hours, not for days, not for weeks, seven to 10 months. Solely by changing the energy source, we just redefined the plane into something almost like a satellite. But maybe the more important for war story of energy is illustrated by this guy. In all of human history, uh, weapons used kinetic force a fist, a spear, a bullet. And the idea of using energy as a weapon was science fiction. So the first time we meet Han Solo, you know, he tells uh, Luke Skywalker, there's nothing better than having that blaster by your side. Now, I'm gonna, spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't seen the, the recent movies, uh, you really, you know, I've given you enough warning. Um, in the movies, it's 30 years later. And two things are notable. The first is, Han Solo is still packing that exact same blaster that he shot first with 30 years earlier. But the second, there's a couple of nerds in the room who got that joke. The second thing is we're 30 years forward in the real world and that science fiction of Star Wars is now real. We advance faster technologically than the world of Star Wars did. And this is not just in terms of tests. So for example, this is showing off a high energy laser hitting a rocket um, at distance. It's also in terms of deployment. This is the USS Ponce, a warship in the Persian Gulf equipped with directed energy to defend the ship against one of the prior new areas, small drones. To 
new weapons like rail guns, which we explored in Ghost Fleet, that don't use the chemistry of gunpowder, but use electromagnetism to sling a shell 10 times further than what a cannon could do before. That not only revolutionizes the idea of the cannon, now it has, for example, the range of a missile, but it's also causing some very deep questions for military services themselves. So for example, the Marine Corps and the Army have a history of a certain role, coastal defense, that they don't do now. They have a long history at it. They don't do it now, but now there is a weapon that is perfectly suited for that and also well attuned to the strategic demands in the Pacific in terms of defending disputed islands. And so they have to go ask themselves, do we use this new technology to go back to our heritage that we that's the part of our heritage we're not as much of a fan of. Another key technology bucket, the wear, the tool itself. There was a technology never imagined in the world of Star Wars. It wasn't in the original Star Trek. It wasn't until the best Star Trek, Star Trek The Next Generation, that we get the idea of a replicator, or what we would call 3D printer, direct digital manufacturing, using a computer design, a bit, to create a thing, an atom. Now, there's all sorts of examples of um, how this is going to be disruptive across the economy and security itself. Uh, it's everything from companies like Saab, uh, as you see, I was recently out with them. Um, they plan to make money not just by selling you the system, be it the plane or the car or whatever, but there's more money in the literal decades of spare parts that they'll sell you. What happens as these spare parts are now available to be made by someone else, including the client? To um, that bus there is Olio. Olio is a 3D printed autonomous electric shuttle bus made by Local Motors, an Arizona-based automaker that crowdsources vehicle design. Every clause in that sentence is disruptive to the economy of cars. You know, 3D printed, autonomous, electric, Arizona-based, crowdsourced design. And again, this is not science fiction. Oleo is actually going to be operating in Washington, D.C., uh, going back and forth at the um, uh, Washington Nationals uh, baseball stadium. To Salsa there is the drone at the bottom. Um, it's about, to give you a sense of its scale, a two-meter wingspan, goes about 100 miles per hour, almost completely silent. Its origin is that a group of university students in Great Britain wanted to build a drone that was better than what the British military had. Uh, they designed it in a CAD program. For, for the World War II history buffs in the room, you'll notice it has Spitfire style wings. They design it in a CAD program, they print it out with 3D printers, and they fly it in the course of a week. Compare their concept design to manufacture cycle to, oh, I don't know, the F-35. The point, though, is not just their speed, not just who did it, but where they did it. And inspired by this, the British military said, this is a really some interesting gear. We'd like it. We'd like to manufacture it. So they built their version here. This is its maiden flight from the factory. It was built on a warship and then flew off the warship. So the warship became an arsenal in the redefinition of the term. Arsenals used to be where militaries made their weapons. Then New England Samuel Colt comes along and comes up with the idea of civilian mass manufacture. And then arsenals become where militaries store weapons. Now we have the possibility of going back to that history. Or a different example would be illustrated by this gentleman. He's holding a tool that he made. He's at kind of a weird angle because he's floating in space. The point is, if you can make it on a warship, if you can make it in space, you can make pretty much anywhere. Another key shift, um, wetware, human performance modification, using technology to shift what we can do. Or the science fiction version of this would be Iron Man meets Captain America meets the Russian Olympic athlete program. Now, it's playing out in all sorts of different ways. Uh, for example, what's going on in genomics is moving faster than the breakthroughs that excite us in IT, to um, hacking the human body with chemistry, affecting everything from how long you need to sleep, your endurance levels, to your concentration levels, to 
where hardware, software, and wetware come crashing together. Brain-machine interfaces, like BrainGate here, where this gentleman, he's not able to move his arms or legs. This is a DARPA-funded project. Uh, but he's been hooked up to a computer that converts the thoughts in his brain, which are basically electric signals, into software code zeros and ones, and that allows him via thought to move around a cursor on a computer screen, which allows him via thought to do everything from navigate the internet to type email on a virtual keyboard. The point, though, is this is not just for people as a medical treatment, and it's not just in the idea of being a jack into your brain. It's moving into everything from, um, well, that you wear a skull cap, to it's used in video gaming, to uh, this gentleman would be an illustration. He is flying a drone via thought. For the science fiction fans, this is Clint Eastwood's movie Firefox come to life and also, again, changes the way you think about our relationship with robotics if you can thought control them. This idea of modification, human performance modification, comes in lots of different forms. It's everything from replacing something that's been lost, like the service woman who lost an uh, arm in um, uh, Iraq to an IED, to getting not just kind of less replacement, but matching it. So compare her arm to this gentleman, um, you can see as pretty much the dexterity of a human hand here, but technology takes you into new different directions. So it's not just that he's controlling it via thought, but he doesn't have to be in that room because of one of the earlier things we heard about the internet, right? Other times it may be surpassing performance in very clear, obvious, direct ways. So for example, every time I meet a Marine, they try and crush your hand in a handshake, they wouldn't try it with this gentleman because very, you know, obviously clear cut stronger. But again, technology might cause advancement in wildly different ways. So um, several years back, I advised a video game uh, series called um, uh, Metal Gear Solid, and it's set in like the 2040s. Now, last year in the real world, a gentleman approached the video game company and said, I'd like to build a version of the technology that's in the game. And they gave him some startup funding to do it. They saw it as kind of a cool marketing thing. This is what he made. It is a robotic arm, but he added certain modifications that weren't in the game. Packs a drone in the shoulder and a smartphone in the wrist. This is not 2040. This is technically history. This is 2016. Now, this should all seem kind of exciting but simultaneously scary. But for the people who specialize in cybersecurity here, they're going, it's scary for a very different reason, because it opens up new vulnerabilities. We've already seen hacking of cars. These are medical devices that have been hacked. It's not a hacker convention unless someone's hacking a drone at it right now. To that internet of things I talked about that's so exciting, 70% of the things that have been woven into it so far, 70% have known vulnerabilities in them. And of course, in cybersecurity, it's not just the known stuff that gets you. The point is, is this leads to this second big meta trend. We have a shift in the overall kind of story of place, not just what we use, but where we contend, where we fight. And again, pull back in history. This is, to make that science fiction parallel, this is the entire internet when we first met Han Solo, when the first Star Wars came out. This is it. This is why Princess Leia just can't email you know, the plans of the Death Star. No one's thinking about that. This is the internet today visualized. And of course, this is done to do justice to the complexity of this space and how we all use it and depend it. But along with that growth is that we've seen a growth in danger. And part of that story is the emergence of new threat actors, or rather the evolution of new threat actors. The first threats were people like this kid, literally the 16-year-old in his parents' basement, who's using that very powerful device to crack into the FBI and the CIA. Now, you'll notice, um, besides that powerful computer, for whatever reason, he has a, one of those old printers with the perforated paper on the side. I don't know what he's using it for, but it's sort of funny to think that's, the, that's how hackers used to operate. But the point is, we've seen it from being kids in their parents' basement, people looking for attention, 
to highly organized threat actors that range from transnational criminal networks to the more than 100 nations that have created some kind of cyber military command. And the point is that it's very complex, it's very scary, but the present and future of danger in this domain, in this locale, is arguably quite simple. It's all about information and what you can do with it. The problem is you can do very powerful things with it, again, on the civilian and the military side. Now, the first thing that you can do with information, you can collect it. One of the other shifts in uh, the story of the internet is not just to things, but also the emergence of social media, where we are all not just collectors of information now, we are all individual distributors of information via Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. And the result of that is that every single conflict actor, be it ISIS, be it Chicago gangs, be it the Russian military, are telling their story online right now or other people are watching them and telling their story. And then in turn, every single act of violence is being talked about in real time. With the result is that we are entering an era where arguably there are no more secrets. The illustration of this that I think um, will be attuned for a number of the people in this room with a special operations background would be the Bin Laden raid, one of the most secretive military operations of our lifetime that was live tweeted by a Pakistani IT engineer who just happened to live in Abbottabad to ongoing operations right now in um, Syria uh, where we can all watch Facebook feeds of them. This, though, is causing a reaction. So there may be no more secrets. The truth is out there, but there is a counter. Disinformation, influence operations, bury the truth underneath a sea of lies. And the specialist in this uh, is Russia, who literally invented information warfare. And we've seen this in everything from their operations in Ukraine to their operations in elections everywhere from Poland, UK, Germany, France, and the United States. Second thing you can do with information, steal it. Many of the people in this room probably got this letter because someone, China, broke into the Office of Personnel Management and stole classified background information. It's just like what goes on in uh, regular crime. Someone steals a credit card. The difference, though, is that now you can do it on scale. So rather than James Bond stealing one file, they stole 22 million files. Similar to don't steal one credit card, you can steal tens of millions of credit cards. It's that scale now that this space allows. But we're also seeing interesting new combinations. So for example, um, the cross of commercial and state-linked um, theft and espionage may be best illustrated by these two planes here. On the top, is the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, uh, the most expensive weapons project in all of human history. We will spend more on that over a trillion, that's with a T dollars, than for example we spent on the Manhattan Project. And the reason is it's to give us a generation ahead advantage on the battlefield. On the bottom, well that looks like the F-35, just for some reason they painted it blue and they put red stars on it. That's because it's the J-31, China's new stealth fighter. Now, it either looks like the F-35 out of sheer coincidence, or it's because, as we document in Ghost Fleet, the design process was penetrated on three separate occasions. It's very hard to win an arms race if you're paying the research and development for the other side. Another thing you could do with information, block information. This is an illustration of what Russia did to Ukraine in the lead up to their physical conflict. On the cyber side, they threw up the equivalent of a blockade, sort of blocking communication between everything from Ukrainian business websites to government websites to individual military units in the field. It has a paralyzing effect on Ukraine as a nation. In essence, Ukraine loses the cyber side of the conflict, the cyber war, before the real war ever begins. 
And the commercial version of this would be like the DDoS campaigns that we've seen, uh, for example, um, in the Mirai episode a couple months ago that locked down some of the world's most popular websites, everything from like Travelocity uh, to Amazon, you name it, basically blocking the flow of information. Final thing you can do with information. Haven't seen a lot of it, but this is the real one to pay attention to. Change it. It's illustrated best by this guy, Stuxnet. Someone, the United States and Israel, built a cyber weapon that went after Iranian nuclear research. We didn't need to steal it. We know how to build atomic bombs. Instead, what it did is it got inside and changed the settings of their physical equipment, things like the pressure settings, that then caused physical damage. It sabotaged their machinery. Now, it's important in a number of different ways. First, in history, it's the very first digital weapon. It's like every other weapon in history. It physically damages the target, but it's unlike every other weapon in history because it was just a bunch of zeros and ones. You couldn't touch it. It could be in multiple places at once. That's how we know about it. It sabotaged Iranian nuclear research. It also popped up in 25,000 other computers around the world. But the other part of it, which maybe should worry us moving forward, is digital weaponry brings its own blueprint with it. And Stuxnet, which went after industrial control systems like SCADA, industrial control systems are used in everything from traffic lights to US Navy engine rooms. So we've opened up a kind of new realm of cyber conflict with far greater consequences. The result is that it's changing our relationship with information itself. So this is a picture from the Battle of Jutland a little over 100 years ago in World War I. And you can see what that young British Navy officer sees. They see a literal fog of war, rather smoke of war. And it's both from ships burning, but also ships deliberately laying down smoke. And the result is it's hard for them not just to figure out where the enemy is, but where they are, where their allies are. Now compare that to our relationship with information over the last generation. We complain about TMI, too much information. Or when I was out at, um, at military bases in the Middle East, the way they will always describe it is they'll say, it's like sipping from a fire hose. My inbox is flooded with all of this data, all of this information coming at me. And it, the, my problem is figuring out what's important, keeping pace with it. What if moving forward, our relationship with information is not too much of it, but that fire hose, that spigot, either being turned off or the water being poisoned, where we're like that officer 100 years ago, struggling to figure out where are we, where are my friends, where are my foes, who do I trust? It's a very different thing, not just for our machinery, but for our mentality. And we also have bigger fundamental questions to figure out, for example, how do we organize, how do we train, how do we equip? And I think that's, again, some of the things that you're wrestling with in this space. Uh, there's one final big meta trend that I want to introduce to this, which is the consequence, why we care about this more. There's a shift not just in the technology and where it's playing out, but there's a new kind of race. So, for example, when we think about China, you know, I told the story of, oh, they're stealing some of our designs, but they're also doing exciting work. This is the world's fastest supercomputer. In China, made only with Chinese parts. To robots, this is an armed robot, uh, showed off at a trade show. Hypersonic vehicles that go faster than many of our air defenses. The point is that we have a shift, not just in the story of technology, but in geopolitics itself. Or maybe it's a little bit of a throwback, because the context is in Europe, we are seeing the highest points of alert since the height of the Cold War in the mid-1980s because of this guy and the land grabs in places like the Ukraine. In the Pacific, we're engaged in an arms race where a China that's um, newly confident, assertive, and capable, for example, has um, built more warships, more warplanes than any other nation over the last several years, plans to do so moving forward. In turn, the United States military has a new strategy to offset it. The point in all of this is that a lot of people believe that we're seeing a kind of new version of the Cold War. But we may also see expressions in different ways. Um, new threats, new zones. 
A lot of people frame this as hybrid warfare, and it works in two different ways. The first is using state assets to appear as non-state actors. So for example, these are not Russian special forces. These are just little green men that happened to show up in Ukraine and wanted to take photos with little girls. The same phenomena in cyberspace. It wasn't Russian intelligence that attacked the Democratic National Committee. No, 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 no. It was a Romanian hacker who, for whatever reason, couldn't speak Romanian. The opposite we're seeing in the Pacific, which is taking non-military assets and using them in traditional military ways. The little blue men, like for example a Coast Guard that outclasses most navies, or the cyber version of this would be university-based cyber militia. But we also have to face up that there's something that fortunately didn't happen in the Cold War, which is the possibility that it might turn hot. As one Chinese military officer put it, quote, we must bear a third world war in mind when developing our military forces, end quote. And this is a depiction from Chinese media of how they think the third world war might go. And as you can see, it's going really poorly for whoever operates Nimitz-class aircraft carriers. That's what August and I wrestled with in the Ghost Fleet book, this idea of a melding between 20th century style politics and 21st century technologies and trends. And the point is, to circle back, I'm not saying this will happen. I'm not saying it is inevitable. I'm just saying these are trends for us to be aware of, that the sort of things that were thinkable in the 20th century, that were unthinkable for the last generation, are thinkable once more. And that has to change the way we look at the world, the way we prepare ourselves, and the responsibilities that we, t we take, in particular, to keep this story where it belongs, which is in fiction. So in closing, you can see I didn't come up here and give you a bunch of easy answers. Rather, what we have going on is just an amazing array of trends and challenges. And that's why I think programs like yours are so important in bringing together both the technical skill set but also the leadership skill sets, because it's that combination, I believe, is the only way that we're gonna be able to thrive in this world of ever-changing trends and challenges. Thank you. much, Peter. Uh, we, we have some time for uh, uh, questions. Uh, we have two microphones uh, set up, so I think we'll uh, dedicate the uh, microphone on this side to our students who are uh, here uh, for their study, and then for public and other questions um, on uh, what would be my left. But I suppose to get us started while lines are queuing up, uh, I'll ask a, a, a general question that I'm fascinated by the disinformation elements of the, uh, of the technology and some of the things that we've been experiencing. And on one hand, it's, it's difficult to think, what do you do about that? How, you know, how, do we, how do we counter that? I don't know what your thoughts would be, maybe for some more tangible, you know, we're living it, but uh, how, do we, how do we live with it? Sure, so th this, this story of um, disinformation, influence campaigns, fake news, um, what we need to understand is in many ways it mirrors the internet itself. So the producers of it are diverse and have very diverse uh, mentalities and incentives and reasons for doing it. So if you think of the phenomena of fake news, it involves everything from uh, people with a very clear political agenda, and that might be a foreign government political agenda, to a partisan, a domestic political agenda, to there is an ecosystem that aligns with it, which is for-profit actors. Uh, so as an example, um, we, there, there's a group of um, essentially Macedonian teenagers who run one of the biggest clusters of fake news, um, things pushed out on Facebook, and um, they 
they're making money off of ad clicks and they basically figured out that Americans are prone to believing the worst news about their political foes. So, you know, rather than selling like, you know, diet ads or the like, they basically generated a bunch of fake news and profited from it. They were, for example, behind the origin of um, uh, the Pope endorsed Donald Trump. Um, which either, you know, whether you are a Trump supporter or not, it's definitive the Pope did not endorse him, and yet uh, they got 36 million clicks on that. Um, and there's this great story, you know, basically uh, the nightclub in the town that they're from, every Thursday night, these geeks basically take it over like kind of old school gangsters because that's when the ad click money from Google comes in and they like literally spray each other with champagne. They're basically making money off of our gullibility, but they're aligned with like Russian dis disinformation. So in turn, we need to understand our response has to kind of mirror this broader, you know, it's everything from us as individual consumers if something seems too good to be true, it's probably that, to the platforms, and we've seen the technology companies go from saying, I'm not responsible for what's on my network, to hold it, I better do a better job of policing it, um, to government. And one area when it comes to foreign um, influence operations, I believe we need to restart a program from the Cold War called the Active Measures Working Group. Back in the Cold War, it was a teaming between State Department, CIA, information agencies, and basically what it did is they tried to find KGB information campaigns, sort of false stories that the KGB was planting, and then counter them. So like back in the Cold War, it was things like um, the uh, um, Americans, they, they spread a story in Africa uh, right before the 1984 Olympics that the Americans were inviting athletes to Los Angeles to try and infect them with AIDS. And CIA identifies it, State Department can then counter it. We close that up at the end of the Cold War. We need to restart it. And it's not just the value of stopping these campaigns, it will also allow us to, in essence, identify the useful idiots, that is the Russian term, the useful idiots in our own system that are taking Russian misinformation and spreading it as fact. And um, we, you know, those are groups uh, that do a disservice to us. And a very uh, straightforward one would be the, um, uh, cluster that's built around InfoWars. Um, and we've seen that is sort of, if you can identify where stories originate, a Russian propaganda source, and then track it, and as it moves into our ecosystem, by identifying that in a more official manner, it will allow people to debunk these false stories. My name is Bill Walsh. I graduated from Norwich 40 years ago, oh, wow. 1977. At the time, I didn't have a beard. <laughs> and starting in 1984, I worked for a management consulting firm. We used dialogue retrieval service. And dialogue was basically not technically pre-internet, but we might only be able to search 12 different sources, and it would cost us $300 an hour, which is 900 or 1200 now. We go to where we are now. Uh, I have a couple concerns. The collapse of the internet, that would be one, if that's possible, and what your thoughts are on that. And also, all of our gadgetry, what is happening to our human communications face-to-face, -face, um, and where is that going when everybody walking down the street is tied to their phones, and you say hi to somebody, and they go right back to your phones. Thank you. So, you know, great big questions. In terms of the threat to the overall internet itself, um, one of the, there are a variety of threats that might do it, you know, to the, the underlying systems, uh, for example, which power it or certain parts of the hardware. But the great thing of the internet is its structure itself, um, by being networked, uh, gives it resilience, um, allows it to recovery, allows it to work around. That's what makes, for example, it so very difficult to censor things on the internet. Wherever you throw up a block, uh, things move around it. So to me, um, I'm less worried about the 
overall threats to the internet versus what the threats that move within or on the internet that are enhanced by it. And that might be, as we talked about, um, cyber threats, uh, which with the emergence of the Internet of Things move you know, this story from stealing your secrets to causing physical change in the world. So uh, the difference of you know, your files being hacked versus your car being hacked. And we've already seen, you know, as I mentioned, someone um, pumping the brakes remotely from a car. So we'll see more and more physical consequence from things playing out. And again, why is that? because of all the positive things that the internet is uh, running in our world. Um, we're not gonna move away from it because of these threats. The other is the ideology side, and this, that's where the question of fake news, where we've seen um, certain poisoning of our uh, political system to um, the internet allows uh, people um, to find each other online, and it might be people finding love, or it might be people who share an ideology of hate finding each other. And that's why we've seen sort of the story of a rise of ISIS and its ability to um, uh, energize lone wolf actors thousands of miles away. So to me, it's not the threat to the internet itself, it's the threats born upon the internet. Um, your second question, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a generational shift. Um, you know, we, we had certain skill sets, um, uh, you know, our ability to have conversations on the phone has um, fundamentally changed. Um, you know, some people think nothing of picking up the phone, and other people are completely allergic to it. Um, and the same as you mentioned, you know, looking down all the time. Um, the reality, though, is that's always been the case. Every new technology, it's changed the way we communicate, um, and uh, you know, not just in our interpersonal but in our politics itself. My, my favorite illustration of this is that um, the average length of a speech by a politician uh, essentially went with the advent of the radio from about an hour in length to under 10 minutes in length. And then you get, that's, then you go, oh my gosh, and back then people are horrified by that. Well now, you know, you get television to, well, it's 140 characters. Uh, so we've always seen this, but the point is, you know, people back with the radio would have said the same thing. Yeah. So uh, speaking on behalf of, you know, kind of my generation's age group, I don't think any of us want war. We've had enough history of it. Um, I want humans to walk on other planets, and I would love to see a dinosaur. That would be really cool. Um, as much as I want a Bugatti Caron, I understand that buying a 1.5 million dollar vehicle uh, probably disenfranchises a lot of other individuals to get to that point. Um, but what can we do, uh, you know, keeping in mind the inherent human corruption to remove some of the power um, that elitists that are driven by power and profit, um, you know, to get them out of control that are causing a lot of these conflicts um, using this technology that's pretty much connecting everything. So this, you know, this question, this story that you lay out, I mean, this is a, this is not a 2017 question. It, it could be a 20, it could be a 2000 BC question. You know, we've always had this back and forth between the search for peace and the history of humans at battle with each other. And it's linked to the story of technology is just as long. Um, technology, you know, my take is technology itself doesn't have a morality. It's the way the humans behind it use it. So the very first technology, someone picked up a rock and they either used it to build something, you know, like a fireplace or a tool or they bash someone in the head in it. And that's the same story moving forward when we think about to the last question, the internet. You know, it's been the most powerful force for good in our, certainly our lifetimes in terms of spreading knowledge and um, business efficiency and whatever uh, to, oh, by the way, it's been a portal for hate. Um, so we've seen this kind of story again and again. I think what you then raise is really an issue of how do we go after some of the underlying causes and when are the causes, um, the wrong people are empowered or when are the causes some kind of underlying scarcity 
Um, again, is it then an ideology? Um, I think what should worry us right now is the just sheer amount of flux that's going on in not just American politics, but global politics writ large. And again, to go back to that, you know, this seem seemingly was a talk about the future, but we keep referencing history. You know, what are the historic parallels for where we are today? And people keep making these parallels, and I think there are some apt ones to those periods of like kind of 1920s and 30s in terms of global ideological change, economic change, technology shift, um, old rules falling by the wayside, the emergence of populism, you name it. And those are some scary parallels. And so then we have to ask ourselves, okay, what are the fire breaks? What are the structures? And again, that might be political structures, it might be moral structures that we can put in place to avoid those kind of bad outcomes that we've seen in the past. That's similarly, um, you know, the, the project that August and I did, you know, it's, it's a novel. It's not, we hope, a act of prediction. Who wants a world war to happen? We hope in many ways it's kind of an act of prevention and that by identifying some of the trend lines, identifying some of the mistakes that people make that it allows you to then take measures to avoid it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just have a, uh, would like to know your thoughts. Um, we're about nine months after the election and I was just listening to VPR today and they were still discussing the Russian influence on the election, which is huge. Um, at the time, you know, last year I just thought it was, you know, sore losers or this or that or, or, the, or the other thing. What, what kind of strategic, purely d strategic, you know, aside from politics, does Russian, Russia have manipulating elections other than making us look, you know, stupid and incompetent? And what, what are some of the things that they can do to, to uh, you know, better their position? Sure, sure. So it's important first, again, it kind of connects your question about fake news to the last question. Um, one of the biggest challenges is that we no longer all agree on common facts, let alone kind of common rules of the game. So I have to preface my answer to establish the common facts. Um, and even then, some people in the room won't believe them, but frankly, these are the facts of the matter. So the facts of the matter are that um, the Russian, uh, as I mentioned, uh, campaign hit both Democrat and Republican targets. Democratic National Committee, Republican National Committee, both Republican and Democrat prominent individuals. You'll recall John Podesta, but also Colin Powell, both got breached. Um, both clear political organizations, like I mentioned, to governmental organizations like the Pentagon Joint Staff email system, to uh, organizations outside this space like uh, a series of American universities and think tanks. It started well before the election, it's been documented as continuing after the election. In fact, one of the um, uh, attacks used uh, the hook of downloading election results to try and trick people to doing it. It didn't just target America. It targeted um, everything from Norwegian Nuclear Research Institute to Danish Defense Ministry to the World Anti-Doping Agency um, after Russian athletes were caught doping to elections in everywhere from uh, France to Germany, you name it. Okay, so bigger than just that. So you can't look at it through the partisan lens. Ah, but how do we know it was Russia? Well, at least the groups that have concluded it was Russia include all American intelligence agencies, the FBI, the intelligence agencies of all our leading allies, UK, France, Australia, Estonia, Czech, why would they care about this? To maybe more important, five different cybersecurity companies. That's really interesting because private companies in cybersecurity are incentivized to disagree with each other. They like to debunk each other's work. So the fact that five of them all concluded the same thing is a really big deal. So we have to, I have to establish this because we've had a back and forth in our politics of first when it happened in the summertime, we had prominent individuals say, well, it, there was no hack, this is all made up, to then, well, it was a 400 pound hacker, to, oh no, it was some kid, uh, it was a teenager in their basement, to finally, um, on January 11th, uh, we had 
finally, the former President Obama and the current President Trump finally both say Russia did it. He's since gone back and said, well, and actually it may not have been them. So the point is, we can't even get to your question about what do we do about it till we accept the common facts of the matter. And the problem then of this kind of allowing a clear national security issue, not just a dem democracy issue, but you know, this affects cyber deterrence moving forward is that you know, we haven't been able to um, have an effective conversation as long as we cling to this kind of um, misinformation about what's playing out. Um, what can we do about it? Uh, I, I, there's a wide variety of things we can talk longer on, but they involve both sort of what you asked about building up resilient structures, um, but also deterrence involves retaliation. And um, in effect, right now, uh, these cyber attacks are viewed by the attacker as incredibly low cost to generate, low cost in terms of the consequence for you, and high gain because a nation with the economy equivalent of Spain, the 13th largest economy and falling, has basically uh, caused massive disarray and disruption among its enemies us and our allies. And we've got to change that dynamic. Um, my question is, um, as vulnerabilities are growing so rapidly, uh, what are your thoughts on non-state organized groups of hackers like Anonymous on the effects they'll continue to have as these vulnerabilities grow on uh, not just national security, but it could be economy, a society in general. Because while it might be amusing to see that they hacked into ISIS's um, social media accounts and put links to pornography or things like that, um, that opens the door for uh, retaliations and and further terrorist attacks to, you know, be the cause of taking more lives. So there's a, a long history, um, and that's one of the sort of different aspects when you think about cyberspace of non-state actors being influential and also allowing new types of non-state actors. And Anonymous, as you mentioned, is like a perfect illustration of that where it's a hacktivist group. It's a new form of activism. Um, it's a network. And despite it being named anonymous, it's actually literally out in the open um, in terms of a target is collectively agreed upon, the dates of when they're going after it, what we're all gonna do, and kind of people pitch in. Um, but it has an ethic contrary, this goes back to one of the, uh, of the way we think about you know, youth today, millennials, is that you don't try and take personal credit for it. It also, as you note, um, illustrates the kind of back and forth of how we view the, the ethics or the morality of the group. So Anonymous has um, simultaneously been thanked and lauded by, uh, I was in an event where the, an assistant secretary of state mentioned sort of their activities against ISIS, it's, you know, great stuff. Simultaneously, it's had, you know, the Department of Justice go after it. Um, the origin of the group, the very first mention of Anonymous is actually when it went after um, a child uh, sex crimes ring and it was applauded in the media and then later on, you know, we, you get this back and forth and I think again that, that notion, it's like any other history of um, activism, it kind of depends on how you think of uh, the cause. Um, so, you know, we're in, we're in New England, was uh, civil, you know, the home of civil disobedience and Thoreau, was he a great figure or was he a guy who wouldn't pay his taxes? Um, you know, depends on the way you looked at him. He was an anti-war protester, wouldn't pay his taxes. Um, so moving forward, we'll continue to see more and more of these groups just by the, the sheer nature of the space. And um, as I mentioned in the past question, able to do more and more actions with real consequences as opposed to just um, nuisance type or, or joke type things or symbolic. They'll be able to do more consequential activities, again, for better or for worse. But there is a reality in this space that 
because of the sheer scale of organization, um, the big dogs still bite the most. So a group like Anonymous, a clear, important player, but it doesn't have the heft that a Chinese third department or a national security agency, because they don't have the scale, resources, people, budget, um, the type of cyber weaponry. So non-state actors matter more than they've ever before, but states aren't going away. I, uh, I studied uh, Soviet active measures in interwar Britain uh, and their influence operations and such. Uh, inevitably, what it, uh, of course, I do see there's lots of, uh, you know, they say history maybe doesn't, it doesn't necessarily repeat, but it rhymes. Mm -hmm. And there is uh, definitely some of that going on. But there's, I think there's been a lot, Russians have been trying to disrupt us for, for some time, obviously. Uh, my question comes, and really, I was just wondering if you would just talk a little bit about the, uh, the civil liberties aspect to uh, to this uh, this new kind of warfare, and then maybe seeing how that's uh, can be uh, how that's how that works also with you know a government power. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's a great question and it, it's a tough one to end on because you know it's literally a, a, a course is a library's worth of things. I think maybe the way to frame it is. There, there are definite historic echoes, but there's new challenges in everything from the legal authorities um, to the new, you use government as you sort of, you know, the adjudicator here, but what's different now is that we see private companies in that role of adjudicating sort of free speech rights in a way they haven't previously. Um, and you could see this, the, the, the challenge that uh, technology companies, the Facebooks, the Twitters, et cetera, are going through where originally, um, you know, they're, they're, they're engineers in background. They, they, aren't inter they, they weren't free speech advocates. They wanted to create great new product. And their attitude towards it was, my clients, my customers, it's a platform, they'll use it. We're, we don't want to be in terms of regulating our customers. And as any, you know, we're in a space of people with interest in politics, that quickly becomes untenable. Um, it becomes, uh, first there's clear crimes that everyone agrees they don't want to have happen on their systems. So things like um, uh, child sex crimes. And so very soon social network companies say, yeah, you can do anything except this. Then they start to run into the politics of where their um, customers live. So, for example, it is our right as Americans to be utterly stupid, ahistoric, and evil and say the Holocaust didn't happen, even though it did. Whereas in France, to say the same thing would be to commit a crime. And so how does a company navigate that? To Then we get the challenges more recently with um, acts of violence and um, related to a group like an ISIS. So uh, what happens when there is violence shown on your social network? The companies go from saying, well, I, you know, I'm not in charge of regulating that to, okay, yeah, I don't want terrorists to use my network. So then they say, okay, no acts of violence on our network. But then they get interesting things like, well, that means they're automatically censoring imagery from World War II. And they're like, no, 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 that's history. We can't censor history. Or then the people who are engaging in counter extremism say, no, 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 we need you to show that violence that ISIS is doing so we can argue against them and show how they're a violent organization. And again, circle back, it's a, it's a group of engineers, it's a technology company that's being asked to adjudicate this to circle back to your fake news. They go from saying it's not our role to police fake news to the 2016 election, they go, I don't like the idea that our customers are being taken advantage of in this way by a bunch of everything from, you know, kind of post-Soviet echoes of influence operations to a bunch of teenagers who are prof profiting off of their gullibility. And so they're now moving to both regulate it, but also, weirdly enough, and it's a great way to end, develop new technology to try and solve our political questions. So if you go from Facebook to Twitter and the like, and you ask them, how are you going to deal with these problems of, for example, hate speech and violence and all the bad things on your network? Their answer, 
artificial intelligence. And of course, that will open up a whole new set of wonderful political questions. So the great thing for all of us in this space is um, no matter the technology, we're always going to be in business. And so uh, may we gather here 200 years from now. Thank you.